Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bjorn, for the kind introduction and uh, for everyone for the for tuning in. Um, so yeah, I, uh, as Bjorn mentioned, um, I'm quite happy to be involved in, in the Fidelio Consortium. And um, as part of the work that, uh, that we're doing, of course, um, we see a lot of potential with, with advances in computer tomography. And so with this uh, talk today, I wanted to um, not really focus on, on the specifics of, of the Fidelio work, but in general, um, introduce everyone a bit to, to a really exciting advance, uh, advancement in computer tomography, which has applications in a number of areas. Um, but in particular, what I'd like to focus on is uh, in musculoskeletal imaging which I think uh, is, is probably of most interest to everyone here. And I think is one of the most exciting sort of opportunities um, that we're seeing in, in CT and in, in spectral CT. So um, what I, I think maybe I can just briefly uh, describe CT. I think a lot of people know what CT is, but just in general, um, clinically where CT is uh, has its strengths and, and CT is really um, important in the radiology department in emergency um, because it's fast. It's, um, it's used in, especially in emergency situations when answers are needed right away. Um, in addition to speed, it's uh, the spatial resolution, temporal resolution is quite high compared to other modalities like MRI um, or especially molecular imaging. Um, and of course, the, the hard tissue contrast, so for bone or for calcifications are, are very good with CT. So um, it's an ideal modality for this. Um, also, um, because it's relatively inexpensive to other modalities like MRI, um, it's quite highly available. Um, of course, there are limitations that come with CT, as we know, um, ionizing radiation, and this is al always um, a balance between uh, radiation dose and image quality, so minimizing radiation dose, maximizing imaging, image quality. Um, the soft tissue contrast is, is relatively poor compared to, for example, MRI. And just an example here where you see a, a herniated vertebral disc in the MRI quite nicely. Um, in the CT, the skeletal structure is quite well visualized. If there would be a fracture, you could see it. Um, the disc itself is is quite difficult to um, to characterize. So this is where we have limitations. Also with artifacts um, in terms of beam hardening or metal, and these can cause uncertainties in diagnoses in CT. Um, here also an example with uh, the the contrast, of course, um, compared to MRI. Uh, which shows much more nicely either um, a lesion or not in this case, but in depending on the sequence, a differentiation between gray and white matter, for example, things like this. <coughs> but as I mentioned, um, where it's really important is to have a modality that's fast. So in cases of stroke, um, a chest pain, that could be a heart attack, uh, emergency trauma settings, um, where availability and the time to imaging um, and to getting the results with MRI is, is much longer, CT is, is the modality of choice. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where is it used right now? Um, for example, cardiac applications, um, looking at coronary artery disease, um, assessing with a contrast agent, an iodinated contrast agent to see the vasculature, um, to see if there are any uh, narrowings of the arteries, any blockages of the blood flow, um, their developments looking at uh, fluid dynamics care to try to get an assessment of blood flow through the vasculature. Um, not really uh, the, the first choice at the moment, but is becoming more um, popular or there, we're seeing the potential is with myocardial function. So looking at perfusion through the myocardium, um, extracellular volume, things like this. Um, also, uh, in what's known as triple rule out, so if a patient comes in with chest pain and you want to look um, with, with one scan with CT to look at the possibility of a blockage of the coronaries, um, but also, um, for example, an aortic dissection, which you can see here in the aorta where, um, where you have parallel blood flow where the aorta has become dissected, or um, a pulmonary embolism. So where uh, the pulmonary arteries are 
um, are blocked uh, because of an occlusion of a thrombus. Um, and also uh, with, uh, we see in, in this area that uh, CT is often used in planning. So for example, valve replacements, um, looking at uh, planning for the, the replacement valves or also the planning of the procedure itself. So getting through the, um, the vessels with the catheter um, to the right location. Um, also, as I mentioned with stroke, uh, CT is, is critical in, in the stroke workflow. Um, looking at non-contrast CT, it's, it's very important to distinguish is a stroke a hemorrhagic, meaning a bleed, or an ischemic through a blockage because the treatment is, is completely different. Um, also looking at the blockage uh, through a CT angiography or CTA, um, where you can identify where the blood flow uh, has stopped using iodine as a contrast agent. Um, and then also what is usually done is a CT perfusion. So multiple scans and measuring uh, the uptake of the contrast agent over time. And this gives us indications of the blood flow, the blood volume, which are then used to calculate um, what's known as the infarct. So where the tissue has died and the penumbra, which is the surrounding tissue that could be saved. And so these are all very important for, um, for then First of all, defining the treatment and knowing where uh, what the possibilities are to save as much tissue as possible. Um, in oncology, CT is quite important for uh, screening. We're seeing more um, low-dose CT used, for example, for lung screening to identify and characterize uh, lung nodules, for example. Um, also in, in cancer, looking at the diagnosis and staging of, uh, of the cancer and also for CT guided interventions. So planning of the operation, actual, the actual um, operation itself and, and follow-up scans to identify the, the success of the treatment of the operation. And then um, I lump these here together because this is often done, but uh, trauma doesn't necessarily MS, mean MSK and MSK not necessarily trauma, but so in, in this area, um, of course, we know that uh, CT is really good at identifying fractures. So characterizing the severity location of the fracture itself here, again, the, the spine where we can see the fracture very well um, in the tibia as well. Um, and, uh, but also not just in the MSK setting, but looking at lacerations and bleeds, um, active bleeds in the organs, uh, trauma to the, to the cranium and to the brain. Um, and also uh, looking at uh, bone quality, bone structure, bone mineral density. Um, I think a lot of us are familiar with um, QCT, quantitative uh, computer tomography to um, measure bone mineral density, for example, here in the vertebra, um, which requires uh, a dedicated uh, phantom under the patient and also new developments in peripheral uh, CT where we see a much higher resolution um, and, and the structure of the bone can be characterized. Um, but what we do see at the moment in the clinical setting, CT is not uh, the main modality in MSK. Aside from these uh, topics here, or so MSK would be these on the left, um, because of the limitations that I've mentioned, um, we, we don't see CT really in the forefront um, compared to MRI in, in terms of joint injury, degeneration, also trauma, because a big question when, when we have a fracture and we can locate it with CT, and we have a polytrauma patient uh, in the emergency room is to know, is this a fresh fracture? Is it acute? Is it an old fracture? Does it need to be operated on? Does it not? And um, even though we've located the fracture, we can't answer this question and we need to go to MRI or further imaging to determine is there, uh, is there edema in the bone, which would indicate a, a fresh fracture that needs to be operated on, for example. So, um, <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I mentioned some of the limitations with, with CT. Um, so when we're looking, for example, um, at a, uh, even with a contrast agents, sometimes we don't see the, the contrast as well as we would like. Um, and the question here, for example, in the pancreas, is there a tumor? Um, there is. <laughs> I don't see it here, but uh, there is one. Um, I'm also not a radiologist, so I never see them, but um, I think this would be challenging for radiologists as well. Um, 
in the the planning of a TAVI, for example, heart valve replacement, um, we often have patients that have low kidney function and are not able to tolerate the contrast agent. So we have um, very little contrast agent in the scan and we can't really plan the catheter route. Is there a blockage of the arteries that we need to know the, the vessels? Um, for example, in the myocardium, we might see what looks like a perfusion defect, a deficit, but it could also be beam hardening. And right here in the myocardium, that's where we often will see beam hardening artifacts. So uh, this can cause uncertainty as well. And as I mentioned with, <coughs> with the, um, the fractures, is it acute or is it old? Does it need, it need to be operated on? So back to this question. Um, we can uh, we can add spectral imaging to give more uh, secure or more diagnostic security um, or certainty. Uh, here is what's known as a monoenergetic image. It's in this case a low energy image, and when we have lower energy lower energy X rays, there uh, the attenuation differences between tissue become higher. And here now we can see in this area this hyper attenuated region that wasn't visible before. And we can go one step further and apply what's known as an iodine map. Um, and this is showing the density of iodine that's been taken up. And now this becomes quite clear where we have a higher vascularization, which is reflected in the iodine uptake, which would indicate the tumor. Um, we can also, in this very same patient that had very low um, contrast agent dose, um, we can use a low energy monoenergetic image as well, which boosts the contrast. And now we can very nicely see the vasculature and we can see where there might be an occlusion or a narrowing or something that needs to be avoided when we're planning the, the catheter. Um, with, the, with the myocardium, what we saw, was this, a, was this a, a beam hardening artifact? Is this actually a perfusion deficit? Here's actually um, an iodine map as well. And you can see no real uh, changes around the myocardium, which indicates this is, was in fact a beam hardening artifact and not a perfusion deficit. The fracture in the spine, we can apply what's known as a calcium suppression, which is essentially um, suppressing, removing the calcium signal from the image so that we can see everything else. And in this case, what we're mainly seeing is water and fat, and the water is now hyperdense. So everything with water, and you can see that as well with the, with the discs, the vertebral discs. And also in this area with the fracture in this vertebra, you see signal as well indicating the edema that's come in. So this would then suggest that this is a fresh fracture and should be operated on. So what we see with, with uh, conventional CT, we're working with Hounsfield units, uh, grayscale images, um, and with the limitations that, that I'd mentioned. With spectral CT, um, we're seeing the, a, a lot more images that can be uh, applied, material images, energy images, and I'll go through these in a bit more detail, but a lot more is available to the radiologist in order to make a diagnosis, to make decisions for treatment, and so forth. So a few things that I'll talk about here, how spectral CT works, what kind of results we have a little bit more in depth, and what's the added value. So with, with some examples showing, so showing the added value in the clinic, and I will focus at the end, particularly on MSK, because as I mentioned, um, some of the reasons why CT isn't used in a lot of MSK applications can potentially be overcome with spectral CT. So how does it work? Um, well, first we need to know a little bit about how CT works. <coughs> For those who don't know, um, it's, uh, it's essentially, um, I won't go into too much detail, but Essentially what we're doing is we have on one side of the patient an x-ray tube, on the other side a detector. And x-rays are traveling with a certain intensity through the patient and are received by the detector. And this uh, intensity change essentially is measured. Um, and as the, the tube and the detector rotate around the patient, we get an intensity profile for every angle of the, of the rotation. Um, and the intensity that we measure is, is uh, called the attenuation coefficient, so um, known as mu, and um, is given by this equation where we have the intensity measured is the initial intensity with the exponent um, and the attenuation coefficient multiplied by the distance or the thickness of the tissue. Um, 
now in CT, we are typically looking at at Hounsfield units, what I mentioned, and these are uh, sort of a normalized, uh, you could say, unit that basically gives water the value of zero, and everything that has a higher attenuation than one than water is positive. Everything lower is is negative. So um, this atten intensity profile is then received in the form of a sinogram. So um, as this is rotated, we see the the intensity profile at each line here. Um, and this is reconstructed into the image uh, itself and the, with the val values of Townsfield units. So um, in this case, uh, we would have, um, as I mentioned, water is zero. So everything with water or blood would be very close. Um, below, so less, less dense and <coughs> less attenuating are, is air. So air itself or in lungs, um, bone is much higher, fat is lower. And if we narrow in on this range, sort of a little bit more uh, attenuating than water, we have a lot of the soft tissues, kidney, pancreas, blood, liver. Um, and you can see already that if you have, uh, if you're trying to distinguish between tissues or maybe a tissue that has changed properties, is there a cyst, is there a tumor, this becomes quite difficult. So this is why we use uh, contrast agents. Um, but even there, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish. So for example, a common problem is uh, you measure the, the uh, for example, you have a renal lesion and you measure the Hounsfield unit. And you know the Hounsfield unit is, is supposed to be 40 um, and you measure 70. So does that mean it's, uh, it's a cyst, which could have a higher density? Or could it be taking up more iodine, uh, which is a low density, uh, which has low density in, in terms of the concentration, but the it has a very high atomic number. Both of these could result in this Hounsfield unit that we're seeing. So we need to be able to distinguish between this. Um, and both of both the material type, so the atomic number and the density of that material will affect the attenuation that we see. Um, and in fact, the energy as well. So if we would plot two different materials, for example, bone and iodine, so bone, which, which is calcium hydroxyapatite, um, and we would plot the attenuation in this case over the energy of the X-ray. Uh, we would see patterns like this. So in general, as the energy uh, of the X-rays increases, we have uh, lower attenuation. And uh, when you get, in this case with, with iodine, you have the K edge in this range. So then you see this drop. Now, what we see is if we would look at pure iodine, which has a much higher attenuation than bone, this would be e easily to, to distinguish. However, we're not giving patients pure iodine, we're giving a concentrated, a, a diluted amount. So what we see often in the body is something more like this, which quite overlaps the bone. But if we were able to measure with multiple energies, we can see that the profiles of these curves are different. So we we're able to distinguish between different materials if we have more, if we have more energies to work with. So CT number, or attenuation depends on the energy, which we know, and it depends on the material type and the density, which we don't know. So if we have multiple energies, we can start to determine what kind of materials we have. And you can see that each curve is unique for the material. So um, a little bit of physics, um, what we're essentially uh, seeing <laughs> in terms of the attenuation, what's causing the attenuation is uh, in the range of CT is typically two effects. One is the photoelectric effect. This is where we have um, a, uh, an electron that's completely, um, or rather a, a photon that's completely absorbed. It, it hits the K edge. So it's really right at or, or slightly above the K, ener the K edge energy. Um, or we have Compton scatter, which is where we have energies above this uh, point and we're looking at outer electrons that are then scattered. The photon is scattered, it's not completely absorbed. That's not so important. The fact is though that we have these two types of attenuations and we can actually um, measure these or we can calculate them from multiple multi-energy CT. So if we know that the total attenuation that we have is made up of the attenuation from the photoelectric effect and the Compton scatter, and we know that this is dependent, the photoelectric effect and Compton scatter are dependent on the material itself, for example, a function of, of, the, of the atomic number, but could also be density, and the energy, then we essentially will have um, a known part, which is the, the energy, and the unknown part, which is the material. So we have 
uh, if we have two energies, a high and a low energy attenuation, we have two equations and two unknowns. So we can mathematically solve for the types of materials that we're looking for, or we can determine what, what types of materials we have. And that's the basis of how we're able to use dual energy or multi-energy, in our case, we call it spectral CT, in order to get information on the materials themselves. <coughs> how we do this, um, there are multiple ways to do this, um, but with, with the Philips technology, we have within the detector two layers. So this is the, the detector itself, and we have a, an upper and a lower layer. And the upper layer is where the low energy um, photons will be absorbed. The lower layer is where the higher energy photons will be absorbed. So what this gives us is um, simultaneous uh, high and low energy raw data. We can use this to do a basis decomposition and actually generate a photoelectric and Compton image. We have the raw data of the photo and, scat of, of, and Compton scatter images uh, or energies. And we then, if we would plot this together, so we would take every pixel of the photo and the Compton and we would plot it, it would look something like this. And we would see vectors that are representing different materials. For example, if we have soft tissue and iodine, it would fall somewhere along here. And the length along this vector will tell us how much iodine there is. Bone is a little bit wider, but we see a vector as well. Fat, for example, air is over here. Um, and this is essentially how we can get different material card, uh, material maps. So um, iodine, uric acid, or we can also suppress materials. So a, what we call a virtual non-contrast, we can take a, an image that has iodine in it and suppress the iodine, or we can suppress the calcium. We can also combine these images and generate the monoenergetic images. And monoenergetic images are simulated images that are essentially, um, they're, they're simulating as if the energy beam, which is, which is a spectrum of energies, but they're simulating it as if it was a single energy, which is what we have in synchrotron, but not clinically available. So we can have what's known as a 40 kilo electron volt image where, where we're simulating as if the beam would only have 40, 40 kilo electron volts photons or 70 or 200. And what can, you might already see here is that the um, contrast is much higher in the 40. So in the low energy, and that we saw already in the image I showed before with the profile, that with lower energies, we have a higher difference in attenuation between the tissues. Um, what we also find when we have um, the dual layer technology, so we're able to get these high and low energy information uh, simultaneously, is that we can actually, we can better correct the beam hardening because we can measure the beam hardening. So this is an example just of a phantom where it was decomposed into a bone signal and a water signal. Here's the full signal. And you can see with uh, um, the, the beam hardening artifacts here. Now, if we would do this in a, um, a material decomposition that's um, image-based, so where the high and low energy um, uh, uh, information is, is obtained one after another, we would ha still have these artifacts. Now, if we do this projection-based, meaning we actually have the raw data that's lining up perfectly, we can essentially eliminate these beam hardening artifacts. And what we also see is with noise, the noise that we measure in the photoelectric and the Compton image is actually anti-correlated. So when, when uh, it goes up in one, it goes down in the other. And this can be used to almost cancel the noise. It's not quite the same, but, but it's a similar principle where we can really um, remove a lot more of the noise uh, than in conventional or in other types of, of dual energy CT. So, those are, <coughs> that, that's how we do it. As I mentioned, uh, there are other manufacturers that do it differently. For example, with uh, tube-based, so um, either switching rapidly within one tube, uh, high and low kilovolts, uh, or with two different tubes, you can do it as well. Um, but what is also interesting, and I'll touch on this at the very end a little bit more, is where we're going, and that's actually with photon counting, where the detector itself, um, it's using semiconductor technology, and the energy of each photon is, is counted, essentially. So we're measuring the, the energy of each photon. And this allows us to put each photon that comes in, in in one of up to, say, five bins, so five energies, that instead of just dual energy, we have multi-energy, really true multi-energy, 
but also because of the technology, we can also get much higher resolution. So uh, probably about twice the resolution that we have in clinical CT. So that makes it quite interesting, of course, for, um, for MSK applications. So I'll touch on that in the end. Um, what do we have for results? I, I touched on this a little bit, but as I mentioned, the, the energy images, so the monoenergetic images, um, here's just another example of the brain where you can see in a conventional image versus the, the low energy image, a much higher contrast between gray and white matter. Then we have the material images. Um, these can be what I would call sort of the, the general material images. So electron density, what we call Z effective, the, is the average atomic number of the material. We also have specific material images, for example, iodine or uric acid, um, or we have the material removed images, the virtual non-contrast or the calcium suppression. <laughs> Just uh, with the, the energy images, as I mentioned, um, we can increase contrast and this depends on which direction we go. So if we have a high energy image, we have reduced contrast here. This is a, a contrast enhanced scan, so, so iodine signal is seen um, in, in the liver. Um, and you see that this, this contrast between the liver and, the, and the, vessels, the vasculature is almost gone or is basically gone in, in the high energy images. Whereas in the low energy images, it gets much higher and higher. And this is important when we're talking about, for example, detecting uh, cancers, um, tumors or metastases, where we would expect that the iodine uptake is higher. And indeed, that's what we see. So for example, here in the liver, with a uh, conventional image, you see very little contrast in this area. But as soon as we use the low energy image, you can see it much more clearly. Um, now, if we go the, or actually just one thing on this, um, in general, if you would just simply lower the, the energy of the, of the spectrum, and you can do this, uh, for example, instead of 120 kilovolts peak, you go with 100 or 80, um, you do have higher contrast, but you'll also have more noise. And as I mentioned, um, with, the, with the dual layer, we're able to cancel out a lot more of the noise or reduce a lot more of the noise so that we can, while increasing the contrast, we keep the noise the same. So essentially what we're doing is increasing the contrast to noise ratio as we go into these images. Now, why would we be interested in the higher ones with no contrast? Well, what we find is, and is if we have um, an image like this, where we have very, very strong metal artifacts, uh, screws here in the tibia, and you want to do any kind of assessment of this is pretty much impossible here. But if we move to the higher energy, we're able to reduce these artifacts considerably. And here's an example um, of, of a high energy <coughs> image. And often um, this is nice to look at all at the same time. So if you're looking at a particular region um, here, you see a lesion in the liver and, and you might want to look at multiple images at the same time. So a monoenergetic, an iodine image, um, et cetera. Um, and here's just one example that I think you can see quite nicely um, how all of these images can be used uh, together. So for example, here we have a lesion that in, uh, could easily be missed um, in conventional CT, um, but maybe we see it and we're not really sure what it is. Um, and to get a better idea, this patient had uh, contrast injection. So if there's contrast uptake, we should see it as we um, lower the, the energy of the images. So if we use a low energy image, then we can see this, this high signal compared to the surroundings. And we can confirm this with an iodine image. So this is showing us quantitatively how much iodine is being taken up. Um, and the rule out is the opposite. So a virtual non-contrast will, will remove the iodine from the image and then we don't see anything. So that these sort of confirm each other in a way. Um, and uh, the atomic number, so the Z effective, we can also look at, and this is sometimes, if we're looking at iodine anyways, and that's what we're expecting, we might not need this, but maybe we're not really sure what's there. And so in that case, this can be quite helpful. Where we're going, um, and that's actually where most of my work is, is actually uh, in, in research and, and looking at potential for new developments, new maybe new maps or new applications for, for the technologies. So um, things like, is it possible to have a calcium or a bone mineral map, an iron map, fat, things like this. So these are, these are areas where I think it's quite exciting, especially in MSK. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, 
But first, a couple examples. And I'm just looking at the time, so I don't think I want to talk too much about the non-MSK examples. I'll just go through uh, quite quickly um, these examples. But for example, improved detection, I think we've seen that already. This is actually the example I just showed, so we don't worry about that one. But here in the gallbladder, um, you can see, for example, in, in this region here, there, it's very difficult to tell what could possibly be the problem here when, when we see this shape. And um, if we look at a low energy mono E, that's this image here, you can already see um, a difference in contrast. Um, and you can see this, this darker region right here. If we apply an iodine density, then you can certainly see there's no iodine here. So something's there that's not, not vascularized um, in, in comparison to its surroundings. Um, and with the Z effective, <coughs> you can certainly see a change in the signal and it's a lower atomic number than the surroundings. And what this actually is, is a cholesterol stone and, and could be seen with, with the spectral CT. As I said, this one we, we actually looked at already. Um, but also, in addition to detection, we're, we're seeing the possibility to get more information on, on function of the tissues. So, um, as I said, for example, in triple rule out, where, where, um, when a patient coming in with, with chest pain and we want to rule out a pulmonary embolism, we can do a CTA where we look at the vasculature within the lungs and we can often see a blockage. But to know the extent of this, um, or often it's missed, if you, in this case, would apply a Z-effective, so, so something like this, you immediately see all the region of the lung which is affected by this. So this is showing, this we would see with an iodine as well, and oh yeah, here, actually it's right here. Um, and you would see that that in these regions, the uptake of iodine is impaired, meaning it's, it's blocked. There's not as much blood flow there. And that's, uh, you see it quite um, quite drastically. Um, also in the, in the case of myocardial function, um, as I said, we can we can really start to eliminate beam hardening and, and know really where these perfusion deficits are. And at the moment, myocardial function is really the domain of MRI. Um, CT is not really used here, not really preferred, but with these advances, we, we see um, it might be a possibility to, to have um, in, in CT as well. Um, Maybe we see a lesion anyways, um, but it's hard to really define the borders. And if we're looking at uh, whether it's staging or um, planning for therapy, things like this, um, if we're using, for example, monoenergetic images, <coughs> iodine images, you can start to see, for example, here where, where we have this hyper, hypodense region, um, it's maybe hard to see the barriers or the borders, but these become much more apparent um, when we have these other maps. And also um, where we see lesions that, of course, are quite visible and unconventional, but maybe we're interested to know um, where's the necrotic region, um, where is the viable region, and this we can see with, with iodine or with, with set effective maps much better. We can, we can see really where, where's the necrotic region in the middle, for example. Okay, and, and I think the last one before I start on MSK is um, differentiating between materials. So I, I've given that example on is it a cyst or is it iodine uptake. A common problem is after a surgery to or um, an intervention, uh, usually it's a say a mechanical thrombectomy to remove a clot in the brain. Um, we might see something like this, and um, and the hyperdense region. Um, it, it's a non-contrast scan, so would indicate that it's a bleed, um, but the patient just had surgery and just had a contrast scan. So it could actually just be residual contrast and we, we can't really tell the difference here. So um, if we apply a virtual non-contrast and an iodine map, we can see, okay, um, here in the iodine map, we still see it, um, meaning that there's iodine taken up and that it's, um, that it's more likely a bleed. And especially when we consider the, the actual value that we see of the Hounsfield unit went down from 65 to 30, meaning that the signal that we see is because of the iodine. In this case, it's actually the opposite. So we have the signal here um, and we see um, a Hounsfield unit of 47. Um, the virtual non-contrast is, uh, is 45. So pretty much the same and no iodine. So in this case, this would be a bleed. And then we can really make that, that distinction here. Okay, so the, the rest of the time, I'd like to just talk about um, specifics for musculoskeletal and um, things like joint injury, degeneration, inflammation, um, all these things. This is really the domain of MRI. Um, we, don't, we don't get 
th these kinds of images with CT, we can really easily see a fracture. We can get good values for bone mineral density. Um, but if more information is needed and further imaging is needed, um, then it's more time to the diagnosis. It's more uh, scanning that the patient needs to go through. Um, some patients have contraindications for MRI and the possibility that if a patient uh, is being scanned with CT anyways, um, or the MRI isn't available, um, that we can get similar uh, diagnoses from CT is, is really attractive. So um, I'll just talk about a few areas where we see um, potential with spectral CT and we're starting to see evidence of this. Um, so really from trauma, degeneration, inflammation, oncology, bone quality as well, and muscle, and also artifact reduction I showed a little bit, but um, is, is also important here. So um, edema, I think we, we saw a little bit already here are just a couple examples. So again, the question is, we see a fracture <coughs> in the conventional image, but we need to know is, is an operation necessary? Is it an acute fracture? Is it old? Um, here are just a couple more examples where we see this and, and the nice comparison to MRI. Um, so for example, here the signal, the calcium suppressed signal and the MRI image um, look very similar and that's really exactly what we want so that then the MRI doesn't need to be performed. Um, and then again here, uh, this isn't an MRI, it's just uh, fused together, but again, the, the image in the spine. So, okay, we can tell where the fracture is, that's not a problem, um, but uh, is it new? And here we know, yes, it is, we can see the edema. Um, also, what's interesting uh, in, in, so in trauma patients where, again, you can detect the fracture um, of, say, of the spine, but what about the surrounding tissues? And if there's a chance that there might be a, a hematoma, for example, a bleed, and uh, that this isn't being reabsorbed or, and could be, could need to be operated on, this is again a case where further imaging is needed and MRI is probably done. Um, and we actually did a study at the UKSH in Kiel um, where we looked at this um, and and looked at electron density. Now, I didn't talk much about electron density, um, but essentially it's the opposite of atomic number. As I mentioned, the attenuation comes from the energy, the atomic number, and the density of the material. And if we can focus strictly on the density, that's where we see the changes in a bleed because a bleed is non-flowing blood. The blood uh, is basically becoming denser, and that is what we can see in the electron density images. So in this case, um, we see in a conventional image around a fracture, um, in this region, we want to know if there's a bleed. The MRI shows it very clearly, but in the CT, you can't really see any, any signal. If we would look at an uh, electron density image, and that's what's applied here as an overlay, you see this increase in, in density. And this was done on a number of patients, um, comparing the conventional diagnostic accuracy to the uh, electron density, and we saw significant improvement with this. So we're seeing evidence that that from spectral CT we can get results um, that we would normally be relying for <coughs> with MRI. Um, joint injury. So um, I showed at the start um, this nice image to see the herniated disc in the MRI, what you don't see in the in the conventional CT. But if we can apply a calcium suppression to this and remove all the, all the calcium signal, um, all of a sudden the discs light up and then we can start to see where we might have things like a herniation or what I'll talk about in a second, um, other changes to the, to the makeup of, of the disc as well. Um, and actually here, uh, in, in, this is an example where they didn't use a calcium suppression, they actually used a, a dedicated collagen map. So this is really sort of an area of, of research to, to test out. But they could show, um, for example, in regions where um, in, the, in the MRI, where they, where they see this high signal where um, there's maybe been a fracture, these coincide with regions um, of low collagen. So they're, they're looking for changes in, in the collagen content within the disc that are indicative of injury. And, and they're able to see a lot of parallels between this. Um, also here where you see this really high signal in, in, the, um, in the disc and then in the collagen map is, is reduced. Um, also interesting is ligaments. So this is something that's very difficult to, to assess on CT. Um, I still think, so this was an interesting study. They, they could show that um, in this case where there was a tear that you have no chance of seeing in, in, um, 
in CT, but you can you can see it with again a collagen map. Um, I think it's it's really a lot at the stage where if you know it's there, you can see it. I think the real question is to to get to the point where if you don't know it's there, you can see it, and and that's kind of where where the technology is at now in general with with multi energy CT. But I think there's a lot of promise here. Um, what's really interesting is um, looking at the degeneration, for example, of cartilage. Um, here's a case, um, a calcium suppressed spectral CT image and <coughs> proton density weighted MRI. Here with healthy cartilage and here with degenerated cartilage. And you can see exactly, of course, where the arrows are, where this degeneration occurs, okay? And um, in this point, we can also see it with the uh, calcium suppression, so comparing the two. Um, of course, it's not perfect. There, it's not quite as, as uh, you know, drastic here, but it's, it's uh, certainly showing the, the difference. So we see, again, um, lots of potential. Also, back to the discs, where um, we know with, uh, with degeneration and, and loss, for example, of water in the disc, um, in the center of the disc, um, and in this case, um, you also see the, the change in, in the MRI signal. And here in the center, where um, in this case with the, with the calcium suppression, a lower signal is water, whereas the, the surrounding is the, the collagenous tissue. Um, and in this disc where we see a higher signal here, this is indicative of a case where the water is then left the, the center of the, of the disc. And then in terms of inflammation, um, we see bone marrow edema is, is quite a useful tool to look at um, in, in regions of inflammation. Um, and also uh, in, uh, in this case, we have a uh, looking at the iodine uptake. So um, what we do see is iodine will then increase in areas of inflammation where can, we can get a better uh, visualization of a panis formation or um, in general, the, the uptake of the iodine, the increase in vascularization uh, around the joint. And also, I hadn't really talked about this yet, but looking at uric acid to identify gout. So the big question is when I see a crystal, for example, in the knee, and is this crystal calcium based or is it uric acid based? And if it's uric acid based, then, then we know this is gout. And this is something that we can discriminate when we have a, a specific material map for, for gout. Um, with metastases, just uh, an example here again with the calcium suppression. Um, here we have the conventional CT and the calcium suppressed image and then the MRI. And again, where we see the lesions quite clearly in the MRI, um, which would indicate where there's where also where, where there's a high um, edema or water content, or at least uh, in maybe in this case not an edema, but the the uh, cancerous tissue that's um, much more dense than fat. Um, this is what we can see then in a calcium suppressed image that that we're moving away from the the fatty marrow. And again, here um, in the in the spine. Uh, with a with a calcium suppression, we again see this increase in signal where there's a metastasis. Um, and then with bone mineral density, um, we have an interesting project. This is at at Munich, where um, where essentially because we have um, a detector that separates into a low and higher energy um, uh, spectrum, and we also, in the planning scan, the scout view of the CT, this also has this data. And in a sense, this is very similar to a DEXA, which is used for bone mineral density an analysis. So what, what we're doing with Munich is, um, is exactly that, to take a planning scan. This is a planning scan from the CT. And then generating the photo and, sc and Compton scatter images, as we would do in a CT scan. And from here, similar to DEXA, um, creating a bone mineral map out of it. So get, basically getting the aerial BMD. And this is really interesting because for patients that might be getting a scan for something else, um, can still have this, uh, this information. So this is a very interesting idea for a screening tool. Um, and this was compared uh, in phantom so far, also in patients looking at patients with fractures and non-fractures. So we're seeing very similar results to DEXA and the ability to discriminate um, uh, patients with fractures. Um, and then, of course, that's aerial BMD, which we know there are limitations to this. So there's also work looking at volumetric. So um, 
looking at, for example, uh, there are different ways to look at this, whether it's looking at high and low energies uh, images that can then be used as a calibration instead of a phantom, because if we're talking about a screening tool, we don't want to have to rely on a phantom. So this is a, a method that's uh, that's been um, applied here. Again, looking at um, comparison with QCT in this case, and with with uh, really nice correlations to QCT. So the the opportunity to have a phantomless PMD uh, score is is uh, could be quite advantageous. And then the very last thing I want to talk about, and then I really think I'm done, um, is photon counting. So I'd, I'd mentioned this earlier <coughs> um, that with photon counting we have the ability to not just measure more materials but also have a high resolution and this is an example we have a prototype scanner in in Lyon in France um, and this is this is an example of an image and if you are aware and you've seen already images uh, so typical images from CT of, of the bone um, the the detail in the structure of course is not there we're, we're talking about pixels maybe with, with uh, 0 0.5 millimeter or something like this so these are, are much um, much higher resolution where we can start to see details of the microstructure also looking at cartilage we, we can look at joint spacing we can see mineralization we can see osteophytes things like this so i think there's a lot of um, really exciting opportunity here um, with this technology in a lot of areas but especially with musculoskeletal um, for to to look more beyond bone mineral density really into microstructure um, yeah, and then potentially looking at uh, maps here as well. So um, I think I've talked a lot here, so um, I, I want to have some time for questions. Um, this is just one study where we also looked at muscle, so not uh, not so now moving away from from bone, uh, looking at muscle as well. So we we looked at muscle fat. So again, this is a material decomposition in patients where we want to be able to distinguish between muscle tissue and fat as well as iodine if they've taken contrast so this was um, a study where we looked at patients um, and compared the mri fat fraction to the the ct fat fraction okay and then the metal artifacts i already talked about so i don't think i'll, I'll really spend much time here but just as as we saw before that with the higher energy uh, images we can reduce the metal artifacts so that the the regions around orthopedic implants can then be assessed much uh, much more reliably than than with the artifacts. Okay, so that was a little more than forty minutes, but um, but I hope it was interesting for everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you. And if there are questions, uh, we can we can discuss them. Now.